And welcome in. It's good to have short sleeve weather, finally. Yeah, you look like you're ready for the beach or something. I, I am always ready for the beach. <laughs> you were right about that. So we want to talk this morning, I guess, about uh, lab tests and um, and how to interpret that. That seems like, well, that's not my job. I'm not the doctor. But right. uh, once you get it back, how do you interpret it to uh, implement it, I guess, maybe is what we want to find sure. out, right? Yeah. You know, a lot of times the, the topics we choose are topics that or discussions I'm having in the office with patients. And last couple of days I've had this conversation with people who come in with blood work that they've looked at. And they feel good about some things, and they worry about other things because on a on a on a report you'll have numbers that are flagged as either high or low, and that always concerns people. So the first thing to understand is that these lab ranges that are set on every lab test are designed to cover 95% of the healthy population. Mm-hmm. That means two and a half percent of the people are going to have a number a little higher than that range, and two and a half percent will be a little bit lower. And uh, then there's lab variability. There's there's testing error. You know, if you if you draw your blood work, say on a blood sugar, uh, in one arm, and then maybe five minutes later you draw it on the other arm, you might get a five percent variability. Hmm. That doesn't mean it changed that much, but just the the measurement error in the instruments can cause some some deviation. So, but I, most people. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is the the ranges that are normal are different from one lab to the next. So that's also, for, for many of the labs, it's, that's the case. I so, also have uh, questions about some levels, whether uh, genetics certainly would play uh, a yes. role, whether you generally have higher cholesterol or sugar, or, uh, just, just uh, because that's what it always has been. That's true. Sometimes with the lipid profile in particular, we'll see people with high cholesterol and high triglycerides, uh, maybe very high triglycerides, and that tends to be more genetic. But when it comes to triglycerides, first of all, you have to, it has to be a fasting blood test. We, the reason we fast for blood work is primarily for two or three labs. It's a fasting insulin uh, for the cholesterol profile and for a blood glucose. Every other test virtually that I can think of, you don't necessarily have to fast for. So that is one variability you want to eliminate from the the errors is make sure you've got a 10 to 12 hour fast. Uh, Sometimes when you're doing these community health screens, there can be a little bit of variability in your lab work depending on the time of the day. So, uh, and that's independent of eating. So you might want to try to consider getting blood work at the same time if you're doing a a community blood draw, the same relative time of the day. But uh, there are one thing that I think all the listeners and all of us should do is get these blood tests and, and keep a record of it and compare them from one year to the next to make sure we're not seeing any changes. But don't panic if you're just a little bit or a little bit above or below the range that's considered normal because it probably doesn't mean anything. It's like we all want an A on our exam. Mm-hmm. And when we see anything that's a, like a red check or a mark that takes us back to the elementary school days and I did something wrong, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, but you're right. That's not necessarily the case. Which could uh – Elevate your blood pressure. <laughs> there you go. Then, then we have something to talk about. <laughs> Maybe that's planned. I don't know. But uh, w- one of the tests that I tell people that you should really watch closely is your blood counts. Um, you have three types of blood cells. You have the white blood cells, you have red blood cells, and you have platelets. And within the red blood cells, we measure red blood cell, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. They're all s- similar uh, measurements for the same concentration of red blood cells. If those vary from year to year, if one year your hemoglobin is say 14.5 and you're in the normal range and the next year it's 12.3 and you're still in the normal range, well to me that's a concern because you've lost, if you interpret that directly, you've lost just over two pints of blood in that period of time and you still, it still looks normal. So that's why I say compare them from one year to the next. Now this isn't really the job of the patient to do this. This is the job of the provider. But if you're one that studies your labs, that's one that I would tell you to really keep an eye on over time. We have things like the glucose is the blood sugar, and that can vary. Um, if, you're, if you're creeping up towards a high normal range, then we start worrying about insulin resistance and maybe early diabetes. So normally the, the treatment for that is a low-carb diet and weight loss, and that can correct itself. 
the creatinine is a kidney test, and it tells us how well the kidneys are functioning. And people automatically, when I tell them, well, your kidney function is about 60% what it should be. And they'll shake their head and they'll say, well, I'm, my uh, urine flow is the same it's always been. I, I think my kidneys are fine. Well, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how well the kidneys filter mm -hmm. and if the filter is working properly. Uh, then we have the sodium and potassium. Those actually stay in a really tight range, and, and uh, those should be very close to the normal range. The, the kidneys do a very good job of regulating that. And if you're on a diuretic, then that can throw that off. And usually you don't feel good if it's too too far above or below that range. Then we have things like liver tests. That it's called AST and ALT. Those are often a little bit elevated in many people because they're inflamed, particularly the liver is inflamed from either alcohol use or from a, a, a big gut. Uh, a fat in the belly will cause that to go up, and it causes fatty liver. But if you've had a, a couple of beers on a Friday night and then you get a, a, a liver test on the next morning, you might see that rise, but then it comes back down. So you have to consider that as well. You would be better off not to have a couple of beers before yeah, you, liver you test. Probably, you want to do your best for a couple of days to make sure that's cleaned up. Because right. otherwise, it, it's a red flag for providers, and we, yeah. we, we want to do more to make sure things are okay. Well, you don't be medicated for something you don't have. Exactly, exactly. So, And then, of course, the last one is the cholesterol. And cholesterol levels are elevated in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, in my experience, when I look at these, 95% of us have, an, or maybe higher, have lipid levels that are outside the normal range, either the total cholesterol, the triglycerides, the LDL is the low density lipoprotein. Uh, low and is the bad lipoprotein, and we don't want that to be high. We want that to be low. And then the HDL is the good. It's high density and it's good. We want it to be high. So um, people look at those and often panic. Um, and I've mentioned this before. Um, many providers would disagree with me, but um, from the evidence I've seen and the research has been published. We really shouldn't be taking cholesterol medicines just because our numbers are a little bit off. Uh, the cholesterol medicines are designed to prevent heart disease, and they do prevent the, the progression of heart disease in those who have known heart disease. If you've had a heart attack, a stent placed, or you had open heart surgery, you clearly need to be on cholesterol medicines, and we have very tight recommendations for where those numbers should be. But if your numbers are a little bit high and you're otherwise healthy, and you don't really have any risk factors for heart disease, I think it's a mistake to treat that because high cholesterol does not always equate to a high risk for heart disease. Plenty of people have normal cholesterol levels that have heart attacks, and there are lots of people that have high cholesterol levels that never have an issue. So we jump on this because this is something we can manipulate with medication, and we can everybody can look at the lab and say, look how much better that is. Don't you feel great? And actually... Uh, they often don't feel great. The medicine makes them feel awful. Yeah. The medicine can uh, can stress the liver out, so we have to check the liver enzymes. And it doesn't necessarily guarantee no heart disease. So cholesterol medicines are not intended to be a primary preventive treatment. Isn't cholesterol also something that is more readily controlled with diet and lifestyle? Yeah, it is. It's a, a low-carb um, and a healthy-fat diet will, will keep that down, and that's the treatment that I would tell somebody. Lose that extra weight. Uh, get the carbs, the sugars out of your diet or reduce them and eat healthy fats. Um, but just because they're high doesn't mean it's necessarily a problem. Good. So if I can retain all that, then I know how to read my lab tests, right? <laughs> well, now, and your provider usually will... Will give you uh, some sort of paperwork, or at least link you to it online. Is that true? Well, there, yeah, you can go to a lot of places online to read about it, but then you know that gets confusing because there's little variations in how to interpret them. But I guess my point is, don't panic if it's a little bit off the normal range, and get in the habit of comparing it one test from a previous test from year to year. All of us over fifty should probably have these community health screens once a year. We should be watching this and watching for subtle changes. And if we have any concern about it, we should see our provider. All right. Well, thanks. And you would be one of them. I'm one of them, sure. <laughs> Did you want to add to eat healthy? Because, you know, you usually do that, and it seems like the thing. That, that... is a given, yes. <laughs> that's the that's the first treatment. Uh, I saw somebody yesterday who was uh, not feeling well and had kind of been pushed into some medications 
And I said, let's, let's get you off this and this. One of them was a cholesterol medicine. And uh, she was so happy that we were finally doing things to help her energy level. But I'm always having that. Hey, if you want to you want to get off your cholesterol medicine, you just need to change your diet, uh, lose a little bit of weight, and you know that that's uh, it's really pretty simple to, to on paper to do. It's yeah. a little harder in practice, yeah. but we can all do it. Right. Well, thanks. You're that was, welcome. That was that was good. We'll have you back next week. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We've been talking to Dr. Tim McKnight. Talk with the doc, which is brought to you every Tuesday morning at 8.30 by Mako's Pharmacy, offering their customers and community free assistance with comparing and selecting a plan based on your specific prescription needs. Call Mako's Pharmacy, 740-922-5400.